Okay, this video will be about the Olympian gods, and Hesiod uh, wrote a story about how they originated. Um, I think the main issue there is that justice is a natural force. Uh, nature seeks equilibrium and also evolution, these two principles. This is what the systems thinkers are saying. And then culture needs to imitate or integrate with those basic principles. First of all, culture needs to be somewhat sustainable and you can't violate um, the natural order. And then also, um, the, when people overstep the bounds, it can be in relation to nature, it can be in relation to each other. Um, a good ruler will bring bring things back to the equilibrium and also will try to create a higher level of evolution. We'll try to find a way to get people to flourish. Um, and justice is really important to create the stability necessary for the muses to become activated in people's souls so that they can educate each other. Um, and, and the positive movement forward can continue. Um, so I wanted to say that Hesiod gives a story, and then out of his story, the 12 Olympian gods have emerged, the main ones, and I have paired them. I think that they fit together in pairs pretty well, and um, there's a male and a female for each of the sacred callings. And the sacred callings, I think, are the things that we aspire to that are greater than ourselves. So just like Hesiod's um, sacred calling was to be uh, a poet, was to write or tell stories which are epic, um, and then tell the story about the origins. Um, and all of these callings are based on the human condition. So, on the one hand, Demeter and Poseidon are the god and goddesses of these natural limiting conditions within which human culture has to evolve. It has, there are certain limiting conditions. One is Demeter, the goddess of fertility. So, you can't destroy the earth or it will destroy you. Um, and then the god Poseidon is the god of the earthquakes and the sea and um, disruptions of the sea. So that's another big lesson is that um, Hesiod says what you have to do is use your Promethean foresight and your uh, Apollonian rationality and figure out, you know, about the sea, what powers it has, and how you can engage in the, the science of sailing, you can understand in order to avoid disaster. Um, and those two forces play a big part in um, the Iliad, especially Poseidon, so we'll see that. But I think um, Hesiod's story, make it clear, um, when he's advising his brother about how to be a good farmer and how to be a good sailor for trade, he's talking about our relationship to Demeter and Poseidon. Um, the next is Zeus and Athena, the god and goddess of justice. Because of the human condition, because of the kind of creature we are, by nature we need these laws to live together under laws in order to flourish. And he see it obviously agrees with that, and he honors them the most in in a society. These are the forces that are uh, most important, and also that correspond most closely with uh, natural forces. Ares and Hera are the god and goddess of uh, honor, and he see it would agree with that that. Um, um, good behavior needs to be honored. It's not just uh, don't break the laws. 
it's honor the laws, okay? Um, want to do well. Don't just um, avoid <laughs> the worst abuses that you'll get in trouble with, with the law. And also, um, Hesiod talks about how greed and excess power, this this negative spirit of competitiveness, ersis, hubris, overstepping the bound, is um, what happens when the sense of honor goes too far and it becomes excessively competitive, um, divisive, and violent. He also says if you seek, yeah, if you seek greed, you're going to end up with unnecessary war. If you seek power for power's sake, you're going to end up with unnecessary war, and that shouldn't be honored. It's not honorable. Um, Aphrodite and Dionysus, the goddess of sex, pleasure, and wine, obviously Hesiod um, recommends moderation in all things, all sorts of physical indulgences. Um, and, and Hesiod would agree with the education in the theater because he is setting the tone for that actually of the notion of reversal and recognition the notion of identification a catharsis of pity and fear you identify with these characters um, and you fear for yourself I could do that I understand that I get that um, pathos is you are possessed by passive emotions, pathological, um, but it's also identity, right? You, you connect, which is, again, what you thought mythological education is about. Well, this is it, where Aristotle says this pathos, identification with the pathos, the linking with this uh, um, unconscious, the things you want to deny, your dark shadow you don't want to admit, um, you trigger that, you fear, oh my gosh, I could do that, and then you have a catharsis, a fleshing out. So he see it either that tradition already existed and he's just using it, or he's sort of setting the standard for that kind of way of educating, paideia, which is picked up later on. Apollo and Artemis, um, he talks in Works and Days about the wilderness and how to deal with the wilderness, the hunt, things like that. You're supposed to use your Apollonian reasoning and your Promethean planning to to um, understand the universe and how, I mean, the wilderness and how it can benefit you. And also the Apollonian reasoning, you're definitely supposed to use that, but always in the service of justice and in the service of understanding the universe and manipulating it, but for your own survival, not for excess needs, not for greed. Then there's Hestia, the goddess of the hearth and reflection, and Hermes, the god, the messenger from the gods. And and um, Hesiod obviously thinks there are messages coming from the gods that we should love justice, and he's gotten that way from Hestia, from reflecting. Uh, around the fireplace, just engaging in that um, self-conscious awareness. That's how he got to be a poet in the first place. He understood the patterns. And then Persephone and Hades, um, he tells his brother, you should worry about your legacy, partly because you'll be punished or rewarded in Hades for it, and, and you will be punished or rewarded on the basis of the legacy that you leave behind um, and what you do. So um, that's how the Olympian gods fit together. Now, um, if people want to watch this video to just sort of get a refresher when they're going through the other things, but it fits together with Hesiod's view of the human condition. It fits together with Aristotle's view because it includes all the virtues. Um, Aphrodite and Dionysus, obviously self-control. Um, Hera and Ares. Well, Ares has to do with rational courage and its extremes. Um, 
uh, the intellectual virtue of reasoning can get detached from the moral virtues. Hestia is that capacity for theoretical uh, reflection, for understanding the causes. Um, uh, let's see. So the basically, and Zeus and Athena obviously are uh, concerned about justice. Aristotle thought that the human mind emerges from nature, so our our goal is to understand the natural world, not to try and manipulate it. So Demeter and Poseidon, we should we can understand them in a way that can promote human flourishing. We're not just a victim of their powers, and we shouldn't just try to control their powers, just like Hesiod thought. We should use those powers to promote flourishing, but not in excess. Um, Hera is about rational pride, what you deserve to be honored for, and trying to honor other people. Um, rational ambition, trying to achieve at your highest level. Um, and then Zeus and Athena are concerned with political association and lawmaking. So I think you can map all the Olympian gods onto the Aristotelian virtues, and you can map those onto Hesiod and his, his works and days, and then how he told this myth that um, fit with trying to understand the human condition in the sense that we have all these powers, but they, and they're natural, right? They emerge naturally as a part of our our existence as the creature with the capacity to desire to understand but they clearly can get detached <laughs> from the desire to understand and they can become obsessive so it's very odd human beings are kind of unique in this way is that they can go to such extremes emotionally they can commit acts of violence that have nothing to do with survival they can commit, um, they can indulge themselves in sexually in uh, eating, drinking, and sex in a way that's self-destructive. I mean, it's very odd. So human beings can, when they get to extremes, they do things that are self-destructive, destroy other people unnecessarily, um, and they can act in ways that are incredibly unnatural. So. Human beings really have to educate each other and educate themselves in order to actually be fully human. That's the odd thing. Um, obviously, I think it's worth this system, this worldview is worth studying and thinking about because it's relevant. Um, in the next video, in the next couple, I'm going to show obviously how women get abused and some days I really don't even want to think about the Olympian gods and patriarchy. I just mother, much rather start over and join a little coven somewhere far away and forget it. But I know, in so far as I'm in the society I'm in, that these forces and these psychic forces, these imbalances are very real and they've been planted in the human psyche, I don't think they're ultimately the way to get integrity. You've got to go all the way back to the goddess and redo things to get complete integrity, but I know that most people are formed by patriarchy and they need to figure out uh, what's under the surface and flush it out and recognize it in other people, not be naive or innocent and um, deal with it because it's obvious that we are destroying uh, the fertility of the earth and we're guilty of pride we're really messing with the sea and we're messing with the warming up of the sea with our pride our overstepping of the bounds um, we're are we're defining justice and injustice in ways that don't conform to the natural world we're rewarding people for creating uns unsustainable um, societies and for making money, making a lot of money 
off of unsustainable exploitation of the earth. Um, we're honoring people who get rich without any concern about, first of all, because they're rich and getting rich is as a goal is the wrong goal. Second of all, getting rich by exploiting natural resources and creating all sorts of um, pollution and poisoning of the of the natural world is hubris. Um, we're going to war motivated by our greed and our hubris. Um, and, and we're also honoring movie stars. We honor people for all the wrong um, things that are either indifferent or positively dishonorable. So what we admire and what we honor is a sign of our corruption. Um, Aphrodite, um, it's perfectly fine when she's married to Hephaestus and we have a sense of style, but there's a lot of indication that we would rather um, have ostentatious, we have houses that are too big, cars that are status symbols and not uh, way more expensive than and more, um, have all sorts of unnecessary extras just to show people how wealthy we are. Um, and Dionysus, we have troubles with excess drinking. We have troubles with our theater. To what extent is um, our Hollywood, our movies, our theater, our video um, entertaining rather than educating? We'd much rather be entertained with a spectacle than educated with a tragedy. What are we learning from the tragedies we do here? Are we really learning these lessons? Or are we just um, becoming self-righteous or ignoring it? Or um, I, it's just hard to know. But there's no collective understanding of the value of paideia and tragedy as a, as a system of education to develop the mind. Um, our Apollonian reasoning is probably the one of the worst. It's between Aphrodite. <laughs> well, Aries is pretty bad. <laughs> anyway, I want to. I'm going to talk about Apollo in a minute. Um, Artemis, the wilderness. Of course, we're destroying the wilderness because of our pride. Um, she's not going to be very happy about that. Um, we're not re of a reflective culture. We're not um, reflecting on ourselves as the creature with the capacity for noose mind in a universe that's driven by a, a first principle noose. We don't think that way. We don't aim for a microcosm in the macrocosm. Uh, whatever reflection or contemplation we do, it's very rarely with the goal in mind that I'm trying to present here in these videos. So Hermes, the message from the gods, we don't hear these messages. This isn't because we don't think of ourselves this way. So we aren't asking those questions. We're not listening to those signals. Instead, we, ten we want to claim that the message from the gods is that God wants us to destroy the earth for our own well-being. God wants us to use natural resources. Um, God wants, we interpret a lot of things the, Greek would think, the Greeks would think of as hubris overstepping as really what God wants. So we basically make ourselves into God, just like <laughs> it happens in these texts, these Paideia texts. Um, and then Persephone and Hades, we have defined eternal life even as uh, the rich will get rewarded as long as they give their money away. It doesn't matter um, how they treated their workers to get rich, it doesn't matter if how they treated the natural world to get rich as long as they uh, perform acts of charity, which as if the gods don't see the difference. Um, as long as the, as long as we um, contribute money to build a big fancy church, uh, as if the gods could be bribed, right? <laughs> That's what Hector and um, um, Hecuba tried to do. They tried to bribe Athena by giving her all these expensive um, offerings. And we do the same thing. 
we build the mega churches. That's our expensive offering to the gods so we can go to heaven. Um, but, you know, the gods want us uh, to leave behind a legacy, to leave behind a world that is not polluted and degraded, to leave behind international relations that are relatively peaceful, which is what we're not doing because of greed and pride and power struggles. So obviously, to me, you can go read the newspaper and um, all the gods and goddesses of Greek mythology and all the lessons of Greek paideia will erupt <laughs> in your mind. Uh, but I wanted to say one thing especially about Apollo because ever since the Enlightenment we worshipped Apollo as our savior, God. Reason is going to save us and that's what Jung talks about. That No, <laughs> it's as long as if you repress the dark side it will come back. So um, I just want to give an example, a short example of a Neuroscience is kind of the latest trend, one of the, one of the recent trends for how we're going to save the world through um, bio, through taking pills, right, um, ethical, making people ethical with, through pills, through medication. And um, there's a well-known um, neuro scientist named Mr. Damasio and he wrote a book about joy, sorrow, looking for Spinoza, joy, sorrow, and the feeling brain. And I like Spinoza and I've always compared Spinoza to Aristotle in his ethics. Um, Spinoza's basic approach is that the order and connection of ideas would follow the order and connection of things. So he wants to give you this ethical training so that the microcosm follows the macrocosm. Um, his particular idea, his method, is simply to use reason. <laughs> Just think your way out of pride. Pride is this, and you don't want to go there, so just think your way out of it. Well, you know, that Aristotle would say he's made virtue into a logos. I mean, he understands that now you've got to control your emotions with this logos. Um, but the Greek poets understand that, no, if you really want to educate the emotions, you have to appeal to the emotions. You have to trigger the emotions. You have to discuss, well, through music, through dance, uh, through the music of the poetry, through the spectacle of the tragedy or the recitation. You have to appeal to all the senses. Use sensuality to get to spirituality. And then through the magnification of the irrational, the flushing out. But Spinoza doesn't think so. We're just going to use reason to convince ourselves that the life of the mind is best. And that's really nice. And Mr. Damasio has these, these models of the spiritual life. And um, I've written basically a, a book-length manuscript on these things because they're... Um, I like Spinoza and I've compared it to Aristotle and Damasio even at a certain point says he prefers Aristotle but he doesn't have any idea of tragedy at all and he thinks that in the next 20 years he says that neuroscience will have probably shifted the playing field in relationship to um, human um, psychological health and because he thinks that we can have drugs that will cure the problems of violence, depression, pain, um, and he had one more. But, <laughs> but there are a lot of drugs out, right, about dopamine and serotonin and all these mood-altering drugs and drugs that um, block the brain, you know, it's all based on a lot of brain research. And so people aren't violent and people don't get depressed. And, um, okay, and he also says pain. Well, what kind of pain? Mental pain or physical pain or 
Um, I'm not sure. Anyway, everybody's going to be happy. Um, and he just, he just doesn't understand how complicated the process is and how complicated people are. Um, and so I think of the, I've written about, let's apply the 12 God, gods and goddesses just for one example about how messed up this can get. Because the Apollonian, this is a gift from Apollo to the human, to human beings. Well, the trouble is human beings aren't all Apollonian. Um, so what could happen? Well, people might be diagnosed depressed, but they don't want to take their meds. Are you going to make them take their meds? <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to coerce? Are you going to force? Um, so you're not going to, you know, save the world that way. What about violence? What about if someone's, who gets to define excess violence? Is that going to turn into a class race thing? Um, who's going to, who's going to run the system? How are the laws going to be made? Is there going to be a profit motive? What about the profit motive in selling these pills? Are the people who make the pills going to be able to be on the advisory boards about um, how to diagnose somebody? Um, <laughs> what about the people that do the do write the prescriptions? How much training do they have to have? Do they do the corporate uh, salespeople get to come and talk to them? How much do they have to know to make this decision? How much of a diagnosis? Um, who goes to the doctor to get the diagnosis? Um, is this a referral? Do people get to self-refer? Uh, <laughs> what, if, what if people don't want the drug? What if people need it but don't want it? What if they don't need it but want it? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't think of how much money corporations would make selling these little dopamine highs to people who just want a dopamine high because it's, you know, cheaper than cocaine or something. Um, <laughs> there's so many possibilities of abuse based on who makes the laws, what kind of laws, how do they get applied, where's the profit motive, who makes the profits, what's the relationship between the person who makes the profits and the people who make the laws. So right now we have this whole corporate industrial complex. And you know, so the corporations say, hmm, you know, if you make a law that says you can give these pills to anybody who wants them, I'll pay for your political campaign, okay? I pay for your campaign, you win, you make the laws. So all of a sudden, everybody has access to these pills that were originally supposed to be just limited. So everybody's on mood controlling drugs. On the other hand, what happens when <laughs> um, people get diagnosed violent who don't really want to take a pill for it? And are you going to force them to? Who gets to? Who has the most power? Well, white males. Is this going to turn into a big race class thing? Um, so are the legislators going to put some limits on this? Are they going to force people legally? Right now we have two-year-olds, three-year-olds who are getting diagnosed to have to take Ritalin, right? And if parents refuse, they get arrested for neglect. <laughs> so who's controlling the system? Um, what do we do about kids? Who gets to decide? What should the diagnosis be? How big should the um, dosage be? There's no research on overall effects. How does this change brain chemistry, especially if you start with children? Um, uh, how much research goes into this kind of uh, product rather than sustainable economies? right? Sustainable societies. We're destroying the earth while we're figuring out how to develop a dopamine pill because that's where the money is, not because that's where the wisdom is. What sort of a legacy do we want to leave behind? We want to leave a destroyed natural environment? We, and then the other thing is, 
what about if people take these pills and they figured out, you know, how to alter their moods, how to feel good. I mean, we have a whole society of people that know how to self-medicate. They self, they're just dedicated to pleasure, instant gratification, the very thing that he see had told his little brother not to be so impulsive. I mean, technology has enabled us to gratify our impulses and our desire for pleasure. Um, not just food and gluttony, not just drink, um, but also tech, uh, movies, TV, media, technology. We can live in a little world where we talk to whoever we want about whatever we want and we don't care and we don't want to think about life as being complicated and, and, and ambiguous. We don't want to think about the things that Hesiod is trying to teach us and the Greek paideia. And so who's going to give you a pill to make you want to care? So, and of course, who wants to go through that? Who wants to realize that, yeah, I, I understand that and I should get over it? No, you know? I mean, a politician is much more likely to achieve power or a corporate head is much more likely to get richer if you just give people whatever they want, make them feel good, tell them whatever they want to hear, tell them it's always somebody else that's the bad guy, um, feed their projections, create their fears. Okay, so you can literally, through psychological knowledge, the same knowledge that the Greeks had that tried they tried to use as a foundation for an education for wisdom and the same knowledge that archetypal psychologists try to use to educate for uh, individuation can be used for the opposite. So, so you um, assume people are sexually repressed and you create this resentment of anybody who's having sex that you don't approve of. So we ought to limit birth control because it just makes people want to have sex and they have sex. <laughs> so all you have is a lot of unplanned pregnancies and kids growing up in toxic environments. But hey, you've satisfied your, your repression and your projection and your resentment and your self-righteous indignation and created all these social problems. Also, um, politicians can stoke fear, fear of the enemy, fear of the foreigner. Um, so therefore, we have to make bombs and we have to go to war and we're not going to ask too many questions. We're not going to try diplomacy. We're and especially if people's natural day-to-day -day life is one of self-medication pretty much 24-7. And so... <laughs> Just, I want Mr. Damasio to just tell me, given the society we have, convince me that these pills might not most likely be used simply to keep up the same sort of um, trends that we already have. It might, they might be used a lot more for the self medification of people who through the strength of their minds could get over their problems and have the satisfaction of knowing that they've gotten over it through their strength of mind. And they've literally created neuron connections in their brains where they have trained themselves to get over their irrational emotions, to love wisdom, to educate themselves. I mean, all of this stuff in Greek paideia is about neurological brain functioning. Um, and it's about wiring your brain and rewiring your brain. And the great irony is that Mr. Damasio talks about um, that bioscience, neuroscience, has shown us that the, there's an intimate connection between our biology and our thoughts. There's no b mind body split. They're totally integrated. And that our thoughts are an emergent property from our biology. And so, therefore, the best thing to do 
as you get older is to develop good thoughts because the thoughts will reinforce your neural map or they will reconstruct your neural map. So he literally <laughs> says at a certain point you can start to examine the neural maps that have been formed. He says some of them are inherited as a product of evolution, just like the archetypal psychologists, but also just like the Greeks. But then, later on, uh, as, we, as things get more and more complex, the only way to deal with complexity is through thinking that um, higher order level, there's kind of a leap to the power of thinking, self-conscious awareness, and thoughts cause thoughts, and so we really ought to order our thoughts the way Spinoza said. Spinoza has this connection between emotions and thoughts, and then ultimately thoughts control emotions because they're intimately connected. So thoughts arise from complex situations which drive our emotions and thoughts, and then they in turn can start uh, we can go from passively having been wired a certain way to act actively recognizing how we're wired and then rewiring um, and forming our minds. And then he presents this spiritual, the goal of the spiritual life would be appreciating art and appreciating scientific exploration, <laughs> not unlike the Greeks, except that it's so incredibly naive. <laughs> And he thinks that just having these new pills is going to enable everyone to have this wonderful spiritual life. Um, he also says that what we really need to understand that neuroscience has um, uh, shown us is that when we hurt anybody, we're hurting ourselves. And so we should follow the golden rule in order to maintain our, old, our own homeostasis inside of us. If we want homeostasis, which is flourishing, we shouldn't harm anybody else, partly because just the act of harming someone disrupts our own inner life, but also because we need other people and we need the culture to be working. And he says, the fitness, the homo sapiens who got along, cooperation has shown through evolution to be a more uh, adaptive property. The trouble is that every war that's ever been fought has been fought on the idea that the enemy is disrupting our homeostasis and our um, love for each other and our well getting along. I mean, the argument for maximizing homeostasis is the same argument that's used to declare war. <laughs> it's always the other guy's fault. And, and we want homeostasis, and we want the golden rule. It's them. It's their problem. And Mr. DiMaggio, <laughs> he never mentions that. It's just some of the stuff he says is so naive. But he's just absolutely, totally in love with Apollo and he worships Apollo, and he forgets <coughs> all the other complexity of life. <coughs> and I realize that I haven't gone through this totally systematically. I mean, it took a whole book to actually get through the whole thing. But I guess you have to just trust me that, that this is a real problem in our society, is a lot of the most educated people <coughs> We are now educated to be highly specialized, and the, the educational system really rewards Apollonian reasoning, and it reinforces it. You get more and more specialized, and it really doesn't encourage the kind of holistic um, microcosm in the macrocosm, not only education, but way of wiring your brain. <laughs> I mean, at a certain age, you do start to wire your brain in a certain way. And it's important that if you do ha develop this extreme specialization in computer programming, a computer language, that you also have this 
broader understanding. Um, so we have some really, really intellectually sophisticated people and products and really emotionally immature <laughs> um, and sometimes people and products. And sometimes it's the same person, but a lot of times it's just that the society isn't cohering and it isn't balanced. And <laughs> it's just, no, there's just a failure to communicate between the different um, mindsets and for people to actually have dialogue with each other and understand each other and learn how to create a society based on justice where everybody can flourish. So, um, so the Greeks had this had a good idea about Greek paideia texts and also about the context. And I'll talk about that in a little while. Is that everybody went to the tragedies? They occurred during a religious festival, and the people had to vote on which one they preferred. And I can tell you about the organization later. But the idea is that the Paideia texts were intended to cultivate these intuitions that everyone could have. They could be common. Everybody would get it. So you're cultivating their minds, their thoughts. So the integration of emotion, action, and mind, you're, you're hitting these archetypal situations so that it's not a matter of IQ, of understanding it, people connect to it and they can learn the the lesson. Some of them will be able to explain it theoretically better than others, but all of them will be able to see it, be able to learn it. They'll be able to see the relationship between the classes, between the sexes, between foreigners and uh, natives, between slaves and free, and see the plays try to show you all the ways we're interconnected and interdependent and they show it through a catharsis they show it through people who are oblivious to that and who damage those relationships and all of this is really important education and so Mr. Damasio I think his book essentially was tragic it was very well intentioned but it's naive <laughs> It's not going to happen that way. It, already it's not happening that way. And this wasn't published that long ago, although he might have written it 10 years ago. But its he's naive. He just doesn't understand the true implications. For example, I have a student who says a college student can go into some office, I'm not quite sure, and say they feel anxious. They can get diagnosed with some anxiety pills some of these mood-altering pills or whatever and go sell them to other students. <laughs> of course. Um, I mean, just the abuses. So it just seems like we should have learned these lessons a long time ago, and the Greeks are doing that. I mean, Oedipus was smart, but he wasn't wise, and all of these people are smart, but not wise. Aristotle said that. Mythology says that. But, I mean, isn't the Germans and the, I mean, <laughs> after World War I, the Germans were high-tech folks. There's no way you could have killed six million Jews as efficiently as you did unless you had a lot of Apollonian reasoning. The Germans were great Apollonians. And that's why, you know, Jung got so discouraged that don't be in love with reason. It obviously, this is out of balance. It's emotionally immature and it's not concerned with justice just like the god Apollo <laughs> so please don't fall in love with Apollo and think you can produce the next high-tech solution to um, energy or solution to sustainability by developing some other consumer product <laughs> or don't think you can give people strength of mind with a pill what you worry about is whether you really are turning their brains into jelly so that you really are eliminating mind. This is what I really worry about, is that with all the um, immediate gratification, the texting, 
and the pills, the part of the mind that does the reflecting, that even Mr. Damasio himself says is the power that neuroscience has shown that we have and we ought to use, is not being activated if you can take a pill to get over your anxiety or your dep depression or your violence. It's not a matter of, of interfering with my freedom. I mean, the Greeks thought that notion of freedom and autonomy was an illusion anyway. It's just that you're denying your, in, your mind and your interdependence on other people and, and you're not developing this perspective of yourself as a creature with the ability to understand in a world that can be understood and the kind of virtues you have to have and the kind of strength of mind you have to have and the way to get it and all the temptations, all the kinds of situations you can get in that would cause you to lose your mind. All of this stuff has to be deliberate. It's an inner dialogue of the soul with itself. And you can take a pill without changing your orientation. You can take a pill without improving your relationships with other people. So how is that going to ultimately solve the issue? If you're depressed because you have an inferiority complex, because of some combination of genetics and environment, a pill <laughs> without changing your environment, how is that going to make that better? Uh, and permanently over time, don't you have to change your relationships? Don't you have to change your dialogue? Um, the dialogue you're having with yourself that's perpetuating the violence or the depression, or the pain. Some of, I mean, there's a mental part to it, and taking a pill might enable that mental part to become more active because some other part of your brain is overactive. But you have to activate it in a way that's educated and that, you know, is trying to achieve wisdom. You have to have a model of wisdom. And I, I just, I don't get it, and I worry about it. So, uh, final wrapping up of this lecture is that that model of the 12 God deities is a model of how, ultimately, when you put them all together, you want this mind, this noose. And so, it's the Greek contribution to creating a new sphere. It was their contribution long ago because it's ultimately based on the power of noose and all the other powers in relationship to it. They understand how those powers, they give a myth for how the powers got disconnected. But ultimately, as Hesiod says, um, people, justice, being a just person, is the ultimate goal because that's also consistent with natural forces. And so this is uh, what the Greeks have to offer. And then they have the other texts that I'll talk about that use those gods and goddesses to teach their morals, their lessons. And I think it makes a good contribution. And I do hope that Damasio and other people will realize, um, uh, you know, in a way, his discoveries about the mind-body should bring the humanities back, should bring the education of the mind back as very, very important, given what we now know about neuroscience and the brain, is ultimately our thoughts. Um, uh, thoughts cause thoughts, and then they in turn can, can alter, we can deliberately rewire our neural maps. It's all like scientifically shown. <laughs> now the Greeks figured that out intuitively, but okay, um, but Damasio, really should have emphasized more the importance of humanities as the education of the mind and bringing it back because most humanities now is not the education of the mind. It's not. It has also rejected the notion that there is such a power or that it's the ultimate power or that education ought to be related to it. That's also been rejected. <laughs> but um, uh, in my mind, that that's where he's going 
And if that's true, he shouldn't say that his pills can completely change the ballpark in 20 years in terms of um, hum uh, mood, m mood altering drugs and curing people of depression and violence and things. He shouldn't say that. Um, because thoughts cause thoughts. And if you don't want to change your neural map, you're not going to, no matter what pill you get. Or all the different experiences in life that lead to violence um, are not necessarily something the person would be diagnosed for. People can be nonviolent in general, and then their spouse cheats on them and all of a sudden they get a gun <laughs> I mean just who gets diagnosed violent it's just so much more complicated um, to be able to say in 20 years these radical changes will have happened I just it just boggles my mind and it really is somebody who's in love with Apollo and thinks Apollo can save people uh, a lot more than Apollo actually can, because life really is a lot more complicated than that.